Church, I am grateful to be here with you guys. Um, like my dad said, I'm studying in Waxahachie, Texas at Nelson University. Um, and so I flew in and I am ready um, to give this word to you that I feel like the Lord has been laying on my heart the last few weeks. So let's dive right in. Um, the title of today's sermon is Depending on God. And so to start off, thinking of the word dependence versus the word independence, what usually comes to your mind? What kind of connotations do we usually develop when we think of the word dependence? For me, obviously, I grew up in America. I grew up where independence is seen as this virtue that we must always chase after. Whether it's making it for yourself, providing for yourself, or making it big, or making your name big, the goal is to make your life independent and not rely upon others. And I, I think independence is a good trait and a good thing for most areas of our life. But I don't think we should let that uh, start to go into our relationship with God. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today, about how the, I believe scripture is, teaches us to live dependently rather than independently on our relationship with God. And so we're gonna be in the book of Deuteronomy today and we'll be in chapter eight. Um, before I read the passage, uh, just a little bit of background to understand um, before we start reading. And that's that Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible. We know it was written by Moses. And we know that Moses delivered uh, the people of Israel by the power of God from Egypt. We know that happened in the book of Exodus and there was the miraculous miracle of them going through the Red Sea and being delivered from the land of slavery and from the Egyptians. And we know after that, the Lord promised to them that they would enter into the promised land, a land that would, they would be able to settle down, build communities and be a nation that is the people of God. But we also know the spies that were sent out to uh, check out the land came back and they told Israel, despite God saying to enter the land, that we can't enter the land. It's too dangerous, we're not gonna be able to do it, we're gonna get killed, and therefore Israel disobeyed and did not enter. And so now we go into this 40 years of wilderness, the 40 years where Israel was tested, wandering around with no home. And we know that the Lord led them here. And in the book of Deuteronomy, this is Moses' last words before they enter. Moses is not entering into the promised land because of his own disobedience, but the book of Deuteronomy is a mixture of teachings, encouragement, and warnings about following the Lord as they enter. And so we'll be in Deuteronomy chapter eight, and I'll be starting in verse one, if you'll turn with me. <clears throat> it says, be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you 
causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right, so my first point today is that God uses our trials to teach us to rely upon him. We see in this passage that Moses is instructing the Israelites in telling them what the point of that wilderness season was. God obviously led them into the wilderness as a sign of judgment for their disobedience, but that didn't mean that Israel's story was done. The Lord was teaching them to rely upon him before they entered the promised land. It says he taught them to humble, he was trying to teach them to be humble and to test them in order to know what was in their heart, whether or not they would keep his commands. He says, it says he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna. And we know that the manna was what sustained Israel with their food. Obviously, they were traveling around, they didn't have food to sustain all of the people, but the Lord provided for them daily the manna that appeared in the morning. And we know that manna did not, they couldn't take it and save it for the future, but it was only enough for that day. And so the Lord was teaching them a daily dependence day in and day out for that 40 years. He was teaching them that he was faithful and that they just needed to trust them. They failed to trust him at the beginning when he had commanded them to enter into the promised land, the land that was gonna bless them. And now he is teaching them and humbling them to test their hearts, to know what was in their hearts before they enter. And so for us, all of us, we don't probably have, I'm sure none of us have actually walked in the wilderness for 40 years, but we've all had trials in our lives. We've all had seasons where it might seem like we are in a wilderness, like we have no one else or nothing else to depend on in that time. But we also know that the Lord is with us, that the Lord sustains us, he provides for us, he's with us no matter the circumstance. And so even though we've had these seasons of trials, the Lord uses those to shape us, to mold us, to test our hearts, to make sure our hearts are humble before him. Because ultimately, I know that even myself, I don't think I could walk in the blessings of the Lord if he has not gotten out all the junk in my life, all the things that I needed to get out out of my own prideful heart. God uses these rough and tough situations to teach us to depend on him for not only our lives, but for those around us, our friends, our families, our coworkers. God is using our testimonies to reach them. The late Pastor Tim Keller uh, summarizes this idea with this quote. He says, suffering can refine us rather than destroy us because God himself walks with us in the fire. I'll say it one more time. Suffering can refine us rather than destroy us because God himself walks with us in the fire. That's exactly what Israel was going through. They were in a place where they had nothing to depend on. No one else. They were wandering in a dangerous land, in a wilderness filled with people and other nations that wanted them dead, that wanted them destroyed. They had snakes, they had scorpions, they had no food or water. But the Lord was faithful in those 40 years and taught them dependence. He was refining them and shaping them so that when they entered into the promised land, they would be ready for what God had for them. In the same way, our suffering on this side of eternity is only temporary. Our hope is that Jesus is in Jesus and we are going to be able to be with him for an eternity. We know all suffering, all pain, all discomfort, all sin, all death will be gone. But we still live in a world that has suffering. And while we are here, the Lord uses those times of trials, those times of suffering to refine us, to shape us, to prepare us, to build our character so that we can sustain his calling on our lives. In Matthew chapter four, we see this also play out in Jesus's life. Right before this passage, which I'll read in just a moment, uh, we have the powerful uh, moment where Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist and the father uh, declares his love for the son audibly before man. 
And we also have the dove, the Holy Spirit coming and resting upon Jesus. And we know this is a powerful moment where the Trinity is being revealed to men. But right after that, this is right before he's going into his public earthly ministry. And in between his ministry and the baptism, we have this passage. This is Jesus' time in the wilderness. And in verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And obviously that's a direct quotation from our passage here in Deuteronomy. And Jesus himself is demonstrating perfect dependence on the Father. Jesus, before he enters his public ministry, before he enters into this time where there's going to be healings and revelations of who Jesus is, he goes through a time of testing. And most scholars believe that his 40 days in the wilderness was a direct fulfillment of what Israel failed to do in their 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus went through this time of testing, but never gave in to temptation. He never gave in to the enemy. He he showed perfect dependence upon the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit as he was walking during this time. We know Israel failed. We know Israel went through a cycle in the Old Testament of being with God and honoring his commandments, but we also know Israel would then turn towards pagan nations and turn towards foreign gods. And it was this endless cycle of Israel being with God and not with God. And Jesus demonstrates how perfect dependence looks when we are walking through seasons of testing. God uses these times of testing to teach us dependence. If Jesus demonstrated that, I guarantee I know I'm gonna have to go through times of testing in my life because I have still a lot to work through, you know? We are all fallen people, but thankfully the grace of God covers us. His forgiveness is powerful and we get to walk in the freedom that Christ offers us. But in these times, we have to learn to depend on the Lord. Back to Deuteronomy chapter eight. In verse six, Moses says, observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Moses is describing how great this land is gonna be, this land that they've been waiting for for years. They were delivered out of slavery and then wandered with no home for 40 years. You can imagine Israel is ready to have a home, ready to have a place that the Lord promised would sustain them and provide for them. As it says in verse nine, they will lack nothing. But we also see with this, Moses gives a set of instructions to them. He says, observe the commands of the Lord your God. Walk in obedience and revere him. And from this, we get my second point. God desires obedience through our dependence. God wants us to obey him, not just for the sake of it, but because he knows what's best for us. He knew that Israel was gonna enter into the promised land and if they didn't observe his commands, they would begin to fall away and things would start to happen that would be detrimental and ultimately they would come back to God. But after they went through this time of judgment, but God is desiring our obedience because it's our protection. It is how we can stay in right relationship with him. We see that the Lord desired a relationship with the people of Israel. He wanted to be in relationship with them. He didn't just let them go into the promised land just for the sake of it, but he, or sorry, he didn't let them go into the wilderness just for the sake of it, but it was a time of testing and he was there with them during that time. 
He never left them, he never forsook them. Even though Israel was unfaithful, God demonstrated his faithfulness. And God is desiring our obedience because it is a protection and not a burden. From the beginning of creation till now, we know that the Lord's heart is to have relationship with man. That is God's mission. His mission from the beginning was to reconcile us back to him through Jesus. God desires our obedience to keep us protected and to keep us in relationship. Think of a small child. Like when I was like the age of five, six, seven, I know I was completely dependent on my parents. I was probably a little bit needy. You could probably ask them, probably ask a few too many questions, needed a little too much, but ultimately my parents provided for me. They gave me food, they gave me water, they gave me everything I needed to get, live um, a life that was before, good before the Lord. But they also with that gave me rules and boundaries. They gave me those rules because they knew what was best for me. And even though I probably didn't see it at the time, I'm still probably working on seeing the point of some of those rules, but they knew that those rules were there for my benefit because they were wiser, they had more life experience, they knew what was best for me. They knew what would prepare me for my next season of life and instilled that in me. And in the same way, God is calling us to obedience through our dependence because he knows what we need. I like to think I know what I need a lot of times, but half the time I don't. The Lord knows what's next in our lives. He knows what the next season is, what is 10 years down the road, 20 years, all the way till the end of our lives. God knows what his purpose is for our lives and therefore will bring us through these seasons in order to prepare us for what he has. We have to demonstrate our trust through our obedience and be dependent on the Lord. And so for us, even though we don't necessarily like Israel follow all of the Levitical laws that were laid out before them, we have principles and teachings in scripture that we are to follow and obey because it's for our own benefit and also honoring before the Lord. We also have the Holy Spirit who convicts us, who leads us, he guides us, and he points us back to Christ. And the point is that God is desiring our obedience because it's a reflection of our love for him and a reflection of his love for us. And when we interact with, with our family, our friends, our neighbors, coworkers, our community, our main goal should be that we're demonstrating the love of Christ through our obedience to him and our devotion to him. Whether we are in a season that is in the wilderness when we're going through trials and things don't seem to be going well or whether we're in a season where everything is going well and it seems like the Lord is blessing your life. Whether or not it's that, the prior season or that season, we are called to obedience and devotion to him. And we can do this by just loving God and loving people. This is how the, Jesus summed up the law was just love the Lord and love people. And our circumstances do not dictate our call to obedience. We are called to obedience no matter the, way, the part of life we are in. No matter if we are at the beginning of my, your life like me, because I'm only 20, I have a lot of life left. But, or whether you're at the latter end of your life and you've gone through so much and you are wiser than most, we are called to obedience. And when we depend on the Lord, he will lead us to a life of obedience through the power of the Holy Spirit. Back to Deuteronomy 8, in the last eight verses that I'll read today, Moses says in verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for, he, for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands his laws and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God 
who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land, with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end, it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. So it's a longer passage and there's a lot you could unpack from that. But the main point that I feel the Holy Spirit kind of impressed on my heart was that we are to remember the faithfulness of the Lord in every season. Moses is giving them this warning. He's saying, be careful that you do not forget. You walked in the wilderness for 40 years because of your disobedience to the Lord. He was faithful despite your obedience and provided time and time again. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness. He delivered you from the venomous snakes and scorpions. He provided in the thirsty and waterless land. Moses is trying to ingrain in their hearts that they should not forget his faithfulness. Otherwise, he says, your hearts will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. And you will begin to think that the blessing that God gave them was because of their own doing and not from the Lord. We, he's concerned about the hearts of Israel. They went through this time of testing, this time where the Lord says he was checking to make sure their hearts were right before him. And Moses is warning them, all of that will not matter if they forget what he did because they will become proud and forget the Lord. When they are satisfied with all of the wealth and riches of their land, they will think that it was their own doing, their own skills, their own talents, their own abilities. And they will begin to forfeit their relationship with the Lord. And so for us, we must check our hearts on a daily basis. We must make sure our motives are pure. Otherwise, when we go through seasons where God is blessing us, we might become boastful or proud about the things that God blessed us with and begin to think it was our own doing. It is so easy for us to get distracted and to forget how the Lord has delivered us and how he has set us free and how he has transformed our lives. It is too easy to be choked by the desires of this world, to begin to think that your prosperity and wealth is because of you rather than the Lord giving you gifts and talents to use for his glory. And the solution that he gives is that we must remain humble in our faith. We need to recognize that without God, we wouldn't be where we are today. I know in my own life, if it weren't for God stepping into my life, I would not be standing here today. The Lord has saved us. He has set us free from the power of sin, death, and the grave. We have victory because of the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for us. Our dependence should not waver because no matter the season, if we have nothing or if we have plenty, we are still nothing without the Lord. We are hopeful because of this salvation that we get, that when we enter heaven, we will get to be in, it, in the presence of the Lord for eternity. There will be no more want and no more desire other than to be in the presence of God. And so our dependence should not end when our trials are over. Rather, we must constantly remind ourselves of the Lord's faithfulness in seasons of want and in seasons of plenty. And so the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4 in verses 11 through 13 describes this concept. And this is a popular passage, but let me read it. The Apostle Paul says, I am not saying this because I am in need for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty 
or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And you see, this is the end of Paul, towards the end of Paul's life. He's in prison when he writes this letter and he's writing it to the church in Philippi in describing the joy that he has no matter the circumstance that he's in. He was suffering persecution. We know from other parts of the New Testament that he was beaten, he was lashed, he was whipped, he was stoned. Paul went through so much persecution, so much trials, but he constantly went back to the Lord in thankfulness. He demonstrated a dependence that didn't matter if he was at a low point or at a high point, but he was content because the Lord was with him and provided him strength. He he depended on God whether he was planting churches around the Roman Empire, seeing healings, miracles, and the power of God demonstrated pointing to Jesus. He depended on God when he was in prison for the gospel, when he was in chains, suffering, being beaten and whipped. But he says, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. It was out of dependence that he was able to do these things. And for us, man, that is motivating for me because I've gone through trials we all have. I haven't been beaten or stoned like Paul, but I've gone through seasons where I've had to really rely upon the Lord. But I've also gone through seasons where Things are going well, and that's where it's dangerous because our hearts will begin to be comfortable. We'll begin to think that we don't need the Lord anymore. But ultimately, the Lord is the source of our dependence and should be the foundation of our lives because without him, we have no salvation. We have no healings. We would not have been saved from where we were from, delivered from anxiety and depression, delivered from the things that have plagued us, healed, None of that would have happened without the Lord. And so we must demonstrate a dependence no matter the circumstance of life. And so my main point today, if you were to take anything away from this, is this. We must learn to depend on God through our trials so that when seasons change, our devotion to the Lord remains the same. No matter the season we're in, no matter if you are going through a season right now where nothing is working, where it seems like the Lord has closed doors or there's nowhere for you to go except into God's presence. Or whether you are walking in the blessing of the Lord, where he is fulfilling promises he's put over your life, walking in your God-given purpose, our dependence should remain the same. And to summarize these, uh, that point, we can do that by trusting and depending on the Lord when he leads us through difficult times living a lifestyle of obedience through our dependence and never forgetting the Lord's faithfulness no matter the season of life. And so the last scripture that I'm gonna use is James chapter one, verses two through four. The apostle James, the brother of Jesus, writes this letter and he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This is the joy that we as believers get to have in our lives. That even though we might be going through trials, James says, consider it pure joy because the Lord is sanctifying us, making us more like him and producing fruit in our lives that points back to God. The Lord uses our trials and our other seasons to mold and shape us, to help us walk in his purpose for his glory. And so James says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature incomplete, not lacking anything. Man, that's, it encourages me a lot because we know we're gonna go through those trials. We've all gone through trials, we're all gonna still face trials, but the joy that we have is eternal. The joy is that one day it's, we're gonna be in God's presence forever 
And in the meantime, the Lord is using and molding us for his purpose and his glory.